Uh, okay, it lives in the water. Oh, Spencer and Steve are planning on eating one soon. Actually, I was thinking maybe we could have one tonight. Ah. Oh. A meal fit for a king, or at least a king of Detroit. The muskrat was originally sought after as a prized pelt, but let's take a chance on this swamp creature to see if we can look past its webbed feet, scaled tail, and gnarly teeth to get to the potentially delicious flesh buried underneath. Have you ever played the game Heads Up? It's a party game. Heads Up 7-Up? Phone on the forehead. I'm going to feed you clues. You'll guess. This is the part of my plate edition, so the animal that is going to be on your forehead is an animal that Spencer may eat. All right. In some Native American creation stories, they say that this animal swam down Buffalo. to the bottom of the pond. Nope. They have up to three litters a year. Rats? Not in the rat family. Weasel. Nope. Beaver. They're a monogamous. Oh, monogamous? Like not polyamorous? Nope. Oh, okay. Uh, deer? Nope. Bobcats? Nope. Gray with age. They can swim. Mammoths? They can swim backwards. Whoa. Webbed like a duck. <laughs> Their fur helps them float. Beavers? They follow the same water routes and create a highway of trails. Beaver. Uh, muskrat. Yes? Muskrat. Yes. Okay. <laughs> they are one of the most trapped animals in human history. Muskrat? Is Correct. it? Correct. Oh, amazing. So muskrat? Nice. But can be seen oh, at Oh, muskrat? Dust. Nice. A muskrat. Yes. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> okay. But they are a rodent. Muskrats? Yes. <laughs> what do you think about eating muskrats? Uh, it sounds gross. I feel like it's just kind of like, why? You know, why would you... Oh, they sound like a symphony of flavor. And by a symphony, I mean like, you know, maybe one violin. It's like way out of tune. The fact that rat is in the name turns me off quite a bit. You could try gopher too, but don't need to. Their long, scaly tail looks appetizing to you? Yeah, I, I think just render that down into a nice fat, just spread it over some pancakes, and mm. I think you'd be good to go. I grew up trapping muskrats, as a you matter did. of fact. I did. What did it taste like to you? Not good. They are a rodent. Oh, <laughs> that's a no to muskrat. <laughs> so here's the deal with muskrats. Nobody eats them. Well, almost nobody. Some folks on the Gulf Coast in Chesapeake Bay occasionally dine on Odontra zibithicus, or muskrat. Then there's a small community of muskrat eaters in Southern Michigan who consume more muskrat than anyone else in North America. It's a Detroit area tradition that dates back to the 1780s. It was about that time when French Catholic missionaries in rural areas made muskrat a regular part of their diet. It was hardly a choice though, you see, times were damn tough for these folks who often found themselves on the brink of starvation. It got so bad that there were stretches where the only sustenance these missionaries had was chopped hay. Chopped hay is the food that their food is supposed to eat. This is where muskrats come in. They were widely available in the waterways around Michigan and easy pickings for the trappy savvy missionaries. And although they'd eat muskrats year round, these rodents took on an even greater meaning in early spring. That's because a parish in Detroit made a special exemption for muskrats that allowed Catholics to eat them during Lent. This was a move to keep those 18th century missionaries from starving to death during a period where they weren't supposed to eat any meat for nearly seven weeks. Now I know most modern Catholics don't eat meat on Fridays or Ash Wednesday during Lent, but missionaries at this time weren't supposed to eat meat for the entire Lenten season. Fast forward to today, nearly 250 years later, and you'll still find muskrat feasts in this part of the country. The St. Charles Men's Club in Newport has been holding their annual muskrat dinner since 1966. The first one they ever did served 100 plates of muskrat, but in recent years, they've surpassed 900. According to locals, tickets for the event are damn hard to get. This isn't unique to the town of Newport either. Newport is part of what Michiganders refer to as the muskrat belt, an area stretching from Detroit to the Ohio border. Some say muskrat feeds are just as common as fish fries in this region during the winter. So what do these folks think of eating muskrat? Do they actually claim it tastes good, or are they just carrying on a tradition to appease the old heads of the community? 
It seems as though it's a little of both. In a 2019 Detroit Catholic article, muskrat feed attendees were quoted saying it's pleasant and tastes like rabbit, roast beef, duck, goose, raccoon, deer heart, and of course, chicken. Then you have others at the event who admit they don't really care for the taste of muskrat, and just wanted to have a few beers and play euchre. The most damning quote of all though, comes from Bishop Kenneth Povish. In a 1987 column, he said, anyone who could eat muskrat was doing penance worthy of the greatest of saints, thus implying that eating muskrat is such a severe form of self-punishment that God himself would surely take notice. Now to help me cook this Michigan delicacy, I've got a real life Michigander joining me in the kitchen. We know Steve Rinella loves a pelt of muskrats, but now we're going to find out what he thinks of their meat. Good? Good to go. Yep. Mm -hmm. Steve, how many muskrats do you think you trapped in your life? I don't know, not a thousand, but maybe around a thousand. So like, so we'll say you trapped a thousand. How many have you eaten? 20, 30. How would you describe the flavor? It's, it, it's, it's little, my wife finds it a little swampy. Uh huh. She's not a big fan. I find that if you do Hassenpfeffer with it, which is a which is a German word, peppered hair. Haas and pfeffer with it is very good. And I couldn't I tried to get you to do it, but you wouldn't do it. Well, the the idea of the show, as as we've seen on previous episodes, is like establish a baseline. We're gonna cook this really simple. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, lean on your Michigander roots. Uh, if you Google muskrat recipes, a lot of what you're gonna see from Michigan are people who parboil them and then fry them. But here's the deal. You're not from Michigan. It's like, I, like you're like telling, it's so weird to have someone be like, well, here's all they do in Michigan. It's like, that's not how they do it in Michigan. Now here's a man who did not grow up in Michigan's muskrat belt. No, you're right. So. Because we regard all that as Detroit. Everything to the south and east was Detroit and you didn't go over there. So, so do, the, do the mitten thing that Michiganders yeah. do. Where'd yeah. you grow up? Here. Okay. You're talking about people eating scraps down here. From Detroit to Ohio, this would be the muskrat belt. And when you look at their mm. recipes, and when they do like a Lent Friday muskrat feed, they're parboiling them and then frying them. So that's how I think we do it. Like I, I expected this to look a little more like a squirrel. And I guess what I mean by that is like a little more pink. That's yeah, like remember I was telling you it's a purpley meat. Mm -hmm. Can we do something now and keep talking? Sure. Well, listen. Annie's getting frustrated that we're talking too much and there's not nothing to look at. And that's just laziness because if she goes and gets archival stuff, she'd be able to support the whole conversation. Meaning when we're talking about how they love cattails. Okay, get a shot of muskrat in a cattail marsh. Get a shot of how his house, his lodge is built entirely of cattails. Get a shot of a muskrat eating a clam. And cut that all in. Mm -hmm. And then we can talk all the time and people will learn something. Producer and talent. It's just like, it's not that hard of a problem. There's a lot to talk about and not a lot to look at unless you go find stuff to look at. Some of those nice gloves. Get a muskrat going like this with his tail. <laughs> Cut that in. I'm just telling you, like people love what to watch you talk, but they also want to see you do it. Well, I'm not gonna do anything. Spencer wouldn't let me cook it how I wanted to cook it. Well, fortunate enough for me, this is gonna be easy to clean. Now, right, see if you agree. Just go cut, 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 cut. We're ready. Here's. What would you do differently? That's fine, but I just find a lot of people, especially like the younger generations, they don't feel in here, okay? Nowadays, people are always cutting the up here. Let me see your thing. They're cutting up here. Uh -huh. You sever all the tendons. So when you cook it, it retracts. And you got little fuzzies sticking out. I'm afraid this is- Cut it at gonna... the joint. I'm afraid this is Cut it at the be... joint. Go ahead. No. I think that... <laughs> Okay. Like, I don't know why we gotta use your electrical pliers. <laughs> what do you wanna use? There, cut it at the joint. See that? Yeah. That way, the meat, see, if you, when, when you sever all these tendons, uh -huh. do you know what I'm saying? It, yeah. you got like a sharp little bone poking out. But I, I think we're gonna see that I anyway. want you to clean that up a little bit. Because we're gonna boil this thing for like 90 minutes. And I imagine at that point, it's gonna like be retracting anyway. I disagree. All right. 
Uh, Sidecars work pretty good for this actually. Oh, but why, why would we use such a thing? So we got what we think are the glands removed. Tail and head off. Yeah, I would do that. Do you care where I cut the tail? No, no opinion on it. Because what I've, I've never done, I've, I've always parted them out. So I part them out the same way I would part out a squirrel. So leg, 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 loin. All right, I'm gonna get this thing under some water, put it in the pot to boil, then we're gonna fry it. Mm-hmm. All right. I like that method. You're gonna rinse the blood off. That's right. Got that water salted? I do. Just flat out boiling it. That's the Michigander way. Okay. Now to be a successful trapper like Steve, you gotta know the diet of these things like intimately. Mm -hmm. So what, what are these things feeding on? It's seasonal, but there's some things that they just always like. So cattail, they huh. build with it. Okay. It's like, like, like the furry end of a cattail. No, they use the whole damn thing, but they like they love the roots. Okay. Okay. So I'm just saying, like cattails, there's always something edible on it, and they mm -hmm. build with it. So you, you can just you can just have cattails, and that'll support muskrats. Yep. But what's funny is you'll see them freshwater clams. Mm -hmm. They'll 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 open and eat the meat from freshwater clams. They love lily pad root. They like you know uh, reed like water reeds. They like to get the root of water reeds. Sure. They'll even go and burrow around. Like I've seen where weeping willows that have the, the, the root bats that go out in the water. Uh -huh. They'll root around there and get the little roots out of there. Um, so a wide variety, but mostly roots and aquatic vegetation. So it's not a diet though that you look at and you're like, that thing's gonna taste bad. No, no, no. Right? It'd be a diet that you think would yield like a very good meat, uh -huh. right? How about with this tail? Like it's very easy to look at a beaver and understand like what they use their tail for. What do they, what do you think they use it for? Uh, it seemed like slap the water yeah, to okay. like warn I don't know if you think beavers. they carry shovels and mud around with it. <laughs> okay, that's good. But like a muskrat, it, it's less clear. No, that tail's working its ass off and you see them going Doing through what? the water. Yeah? Oh yeah. So like propelling them or yeah. like no, and steering I, them? I'm sure it's both functions, but when you uh -huh. see him, he's not just dragging that tail listlessly in the water, that tail Work. Yeah, and it yeah. almost looks, uh, it looks reptilian, mm -hmm. but then you get down and there's like some really fine, soft fine, yeah. fur. Yeah, it seems like there'd be like a, like a use for it. People look at that, a muskrat with that tail, uh -huh. they don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. You look at the fur, it's beautiful. Yeah. They got a, like, like all, like most of your fur bears, they have a very rich, luxurious under fur, mm -hmm. the down, and they have a nice guard here. Good? Yeah. Okay. Now let's fry it. So uh, I think maybe we like look at that on the cutting board for a second and then. Yeah, but let's clean that cutting board. Oh, we should? And get rid of okay. It's a little tail. chunks. People uh, hate, you know what's horrible about tails when they freeze? You can like kill somebody with that I tail too. It's real sharp. <laughs> All right, well, this is what we got. How do you feel about where we're at so far? I, I think you did a great job of not overdoing it, right? Now, we have some options as to like, what to do next in the fryer. Do you want to quarter this thing up? Do you want to fry it just like this? What are you thinking? Me, personally, I would quarter it up because you're gonna have, you, you're, you're not gonna get all your surfaces uh -huh. in, on the oil. I mean, yeah. unless you drop that some bitch in a deep fryer, you know? But if you quarter it up, you could then, you know, make good contact on everything. Yeah. All right, let's do that. You make the cuts where you think it should go. We get salt and pepper on there, then in the skillet. It's almost like it's not so much cuts as it is just kind of, because now that we're doing pull. it. Yeah, now that we're doing it oh. when it's already been cooked, we're just gonna, you know, we go. Same way you'd do if you were knifing it earlier. Let's see how this wants to come apart. Bit. I think take this. I'm not too worried about the plank there. A little more salt on there. I, I know what you're saying about not wanting to like over season and just kind of like enjoy it. For salt what doesn't count. Yeah, enjoy it for what it is, but it's just 
You almost got to put salt in there just to baseline it. Sure. It's like everything you eat, right, is salt. All right, let's get this thing in the skillet. I'm the fry man. You got the it. skillet man. Now this really what we're doing, I mean, if you're curious about any small game, mm -hmm. like do that. Boil, Boil it till it's tender, tender and then throw it in a pan. That could be a whole show. The show's called Boil it till it's tender and throw it in a pan. And what you do, right. it's, like a, it's like a pardon my plate knockoff. Yeah. This week on Boil it till it's tender and throw it in a pan, house cat. Mmm. You used to call them scrats, not muskrats, for short. You don't call them that anymore? Scrats. A little bit now and then, but no, I call them muskrats now, but for a long time I call them scrats. The smell is good. Visually it got a lot better than, uh, than boiled gravy. Yeah, and then you need a little color. Have you eaten muskrat before like a real, in a real simple way? Or is it always going in? When I, no, when I had them, when I made them recently that my wife didn't like, she didn't like it at all. And what I did was I dusted it in flour, browned it in a pan, seasoned flour, right? And then into the oven at 300 degrees to finish it. And she just thought it tasted like a swamp creature. Mm, that was the feedback, it tasted like swamp. Mm -hmm. Well, if this thing tasted like swamp, I don't know that we did anything to uh, eliminate that flavor. The source of these muskrats was uh, they were trapped here in Bozeman. Mm -hmm. So same thing. My wife would like that just fine. It's very good. rich, livery texture, like overcooked liver. For texture or flavor? It's got a texture of overcooked liver, pasty. Mm -hmm. Very rich, makes your teeth a little squeaky. Yep. Like a cheese curd. Yep. The flavor is like very mild. I don't get any. Swamp I can't think of what it tastes like. Flavor. It tastes like uh, it's not like squirrel or rabbit. Because there's I, no spring to it. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's my eyes like doing a lot of the work, but it, it has like some goose quality. Maybe. That's good. Goose. Is that what you're feeling? Shit, a little, little bone. I can tell you that. It's tender. The the skillet I think is mandatory because that like oh added some flavor. Listen, like you, you can taste a little butter. If like you had nice done crunch. that in butter. Mm -hmm and just ate boiled meat. I mean, a lot of people eat a lot of boiled meat. That would not be good boiled meat. You know, I'll tell you one thing. Like the last time I was in here, we were messing with that carp. Yeah. I'd way rather eat muskrat than carp. I'm with you, especially from way. like uh, a prepping standpoint. Um, before, the, the amount of work we put into the carp was like getting ready for Thanksgiving. This, uh, this is pretty quick and easy. Mm-hmm. I think it's good. I think it's good. Yeah. I would go as far to say, this is one of the best things we've eaten on part of my plate. I believe that. Yeah. As far as like I was shattering. Better than coyotes. Yeah. Better than carbs. Uh -huh. As far as like shattering stigmas, this did it. These things need uh, some PR to, to get them out there. This will do it. Pardon my plate. Michiganders know what they're doing. Muskrat is delicious.